this is Don Kaufman. You are watching the Theo Trade Weekend Update, March 27th, 2021. Are the bond markets still running the big show? Let's get started with this weekend's update, though. Talking a little bit about this past week of trades, specifically a last minute, just wicked upside gamma squeeze in the uh, in the s ps in the nasdaq in in the russell i mean everything squeezed to the upside if you're unfamiliar with the term gamma squeeze will you get familiar actually i'm going to get you familiar with that here momentarily but what i'm really referencing in this case you know you, you hear this term thrown around like all the time this gamma squeeze what i'm referencing is just this wicked upside move i mean come on it was the uh the last few minutes of trade of the entire week you kind of feel like okay nobody's looking <laughs> nobody's looking let's go for it i mean look at the size of some of these moves and again we're actually looking right now inside of the spx and the reason we're looking at the spx the spx the options order flow in the spx is what causes ultimately the gamma squeeze to kind of take place but the spx doesn't have any stock so you, you can't go out there, well, if I click on the ask, you know, there's nothing to buy, right? It's just an options only product. But there's literally billions and billions of dollars being traded inside of the SPX. So what is used as the hedge for the SPX? Well, of course, the S&P futures. So when people talk about this, they're like, oh man, the trade generated in the, in the S&P futures. Yeah, the trade, of course, was done in the S&P futures, but it's really, it's the SPX that actually kind of uh, incites, if you will, the uh the gamma squeeze and what we're talking about again with the gamma squeeze just happens to be some uh some wicked buy side activity in the marketplace ultimately to cover existing risk in the markets now if i actually uh pop this out to a bigger picture one of the first things that i really do want to talk about uh, again outside the fact that yeah we made this amazing squeeze to the upside but <clears throat> roughly speaking the uh the last two days of the trading week oh that was some volatility i mean you have to realize that last week's expected move this is something i'll actually detail here in fact i've got it right over there last week's expected move is roughly plus or minus 75 dollars so you're supposed to move up 75 bucks down 75 bucks but that's a probability of expiring by the end of the week the crazy part about it monday we do nothing tuesday we do nothing you know wednesday a little little, little bit of sell side activity i got a little bit nervous but coming into like wednesday and thursday i mean look on uh you know wednesday afternoon a little sell side activity thursday just gets downright wicked we bounce off of it and explode higher ultimately on uh, on friday the point that i'm making with this is all of the volatility for the entire week you know that plus or minus 75 dollars you had pretty much the 75 dollar range right here on Thursday and then did it again ultimately on uh, on Friday coming within a stone's throw of the upside edge of the expected move and that's something that's that's always going to be kind of poignant in uh, in the discussion is uh, you know I'm not here and we are going to talk a little bit about some trade setups and the financials and we're going to talk about trade setups and energy and technology here in a moment but one of the first and foremost things that we have to always discuss is what do you expect the market to do Okay. And when nothing happens, like, you know, roughly speaking, almost three days in a row, nothing happens. You'll hear me on a Wednesday afternoon video. Like I'll always say like, listen, we've done nothing. And I, I did this again this week. We've done nothing all week. Expect some wicked volatility. And there's opportunity in that. There's opportunity in that because simply put, the options marketplace didn't see some of these wicked moves coming. I mean, they already decayed the options to uh, to next to nothing. And again, the reason for me actually mentioning expected move is whether you're buying options premium, whether you're selling options premium, okay? There's there's always some little, uh, you know, tidbit of information in there regarding to be on the buy side or the sell side of that. And that's why I actually discussed that uh, again on Wednesday. On Wednesday, we were saying, look, well, nothing happened. Some decay has come out. Expect some uh, some wicked moves. Not a half bad time to, uh, to gamma scalp, if you will, on Thursday or Friday. With, uh, with that being said, okay, again, we came just stones their way of tagging the low side of the expected move, stones their way of the upside of the expected move. And uh, you should anticipate that. And again, one of the things that I always mention here about the expected move and just incessant about this, but this is again, if it's a you know $75 move higher or lower, you expect that's a probability of expiring, but you expect us to actually tag, you know, the upper and or lower edges of those pretty much week in and week out. Okay, so that's why I actually draw and hand draw the expected moves, okay, 
the week ahead. And we already have the expected move this next week. And here it is. It's $59.65. But we are actually coming into a uh, a four-day trading week. So I wanted to mention that uh, right up front. And it's right up front because... Again, throughout the entire week, we we didn't do that much until Thursday and then Friday, you know, that last minute push to the upside. Yeah, that's that, you know, that reach, okay, that gamma force literally shoving us to the, uh, ultimately to the upside and very, very close to the, uh, to the edge of the expected move. All right, let's actually mix it up a little bit here because I, I really, you know, I look at the S&Ps. And I see this this wicked movement up. I look at the Nasdaq, obviously similar uh, similar instance here. The S and P's are driving order flow there, but the Russell, oh man, the Russell this week was just Mr. Toad's wild ride. Okay, all to the upside. Now, up until this point, we've seen a huge amount of the trade, okay, being generated in and around the bond market. So, let's get down to kind of business here. Are bond markets still running kind of a big show? And what I'm saying that is, you know, the bond market uh, was generating, right, the trade activity in technology. The bond market is clearly moving, okay, the the energy sector along with the financials. So that's why I'm saying there's going to be some trade setups here in financials and in tech and in the energy markets predicated largely on what the bonds are going to do. And I'm just going to cut to the chase right now. I absolutely unequivocally believe the next move inside of the bonds, are, they're going to be moving, obviously, the, the S&P. So are the bond markets still running the show? Absolutely unequivocally, yes. Okay. But the, uh, the first question to kind of ask here is, well, what happened towards the end of the week? All right. We had, okay, we had some days late this week where we saw a little bit of sell side activity in the bonds and it didn't necessarily have that negative impact, okay, to the marketplace, which I'll cover here uh, momentarily. So again, are the bonds still running the show? Absolutely. Now, to get down to business here regarding the bonds, it's everything has to do with the interest rate. So as of late, the interest rates have been climbing, climbing substantially. Look at it on a year-to-date percentage. They're up about 80%. This is the 10-year. This is about, you know, again, the 10-year. So the 10-year right now, for those of you uh, kind of aware of this, is trading in the neighborhood of about one66 percent right there okay it's about 1.66 percent it's off some of the recent high which is about 1.75 okay so what do we anticipate from here listen don't be surprised don't be surprised for you know a, a brief and fleeting moment to actually see rates literally continue to explode higher okay now you got to look at the other side of that. Well, you know what? They probably can't go that much higher because if they hit 2%, and if they do hit 2%, the Fed is likely to step in. So I think that we need to have an assumption that at some point over here, okay, we're likely to have a little bit of what I would term a cap on rates, okay? Now, how does this relate to the bond market? So the bonds are obviously trading inverse to rates, and it's, this is always like a weird and complicated topic to, to have with people that don't necessarily trade bonds. What I'm actually referencing in this particular case is, and again, I come back to the bonds. The bonds are actually the 30-year. The rate we were looking at was the 10-year, neither here nor there. Our anticipation is that the bonds absolutely can have some room to move to the downside, but it's limited, okay? And that there's literally, there's a cap on rates which ultimately translates, okay, to a floor. And that floor is probably somewhere 149. I think you start to get down to the 147 handle inside of the uh, the bond market. People are going to get extraordinarily punchy, and those people happen to uh, to belong to uh, Jerome Powell and uh, and crew. Nevertheless, I think there's a floor in under the bond marketplace, and uh, eventually the forces are going to push the bonds back up, which is going to impede upon trade in a uh, in a very large way. So this is actually going to generate a couple of trade setups here, kind of the near term. So let's actually zoom back into this for just a second. So what are we looking at? Again, in the short duration, in the short duration, I absolutely unequivocally think that bonds can continue to sell off. Now, if bonds continue to sell off, right, what is that going to do? Roughly speaking, I think bonds would have to crest through, okay, the lows and some of the recent lows, which is about 153 inside of the bonds, if they get below 153, it could really start to impede upon technology once again. And I'm just jumping ahead. On, you know, we'll come back to expected moves in IWM and the QQQ and the spiders and correlation. We'll come back to all of that in just a moment.
What's important, okay, is if the bonds are still running the show, that there's trade setups in and around this, okay? So let's look at actually both sides of the equation, and I've talked about this. So again, can the bonds continue to sell off? Absolutely, unequivocally, yes. But eventually, there's going to be a floor put into that, okay? But in the very near term, tech is still completely and utterly destabilized. And if you want to look at tech in terms of the monsters of tech, which is our conglomerate symbol, that's fine. You could look at tech in terms of the NASDAQ, that's fine too, okay, and or the QQQ. But if you take a look at the QQQ, if the bonds still see some sell side activity, okay, it is probably once again going to break the back of the QQQ. So the QQQ very rapidly at this uh, at this 300 level, about 16 points uh, lower inside of the uh, inside of the QQQ. Uh, breaking below the 300 level though could be uh, rather devastating for for the Qs. All right. So what's the other side of that trade? Okay. Well, the other side of that trade is, is likely a little bit of a floor into that bond market. Okay. And ultimately, in a longer duration sense, and this is important, a longer duration sense, even though I see some maybe some short-term bias to the downside long-term, okay, and these bonds have to rally back up, okay? Those bonds are going to rally back up. Now, this is a little bit of a double-edged sword, okay? The hardest trade, the handicap here, is unequivocally tech, okay? Tech right now, you know, that's, that's the most difficult to discern I think what is going to occur inside of the technology marketplace. And of course, everybody's going to, you know, point fingers and say, well, but tech is going to do, you know, and drive the marketplace. It's not. I think really what's going to drive the marketplace is, uh, is the financials. And I think the financials, I think they're a lot easier to handicap in the near term. So listen, when it comes to trade setups, you know, go with, with what you know. And by the way, people can talk, you know, to the blue in the face about the setups inside of uh, the NASDAQ and, and Apple and, and Tesla. And it's got a MACD, it's got a Fibonacci. Look at the Bollinger Band. Okay. What about, what about my 618? What about it? Okay. Because the bonds markets are going to have really the last say. So again, if the bonds continue to sell off, it could break the back of tech. If the bonds rally, maybe positive for tech. Again, I think, I think tech is an incredibly Okay, complex trade at this point in time. I think the trade to go after is going to be inside of the financials. Okay, and, and I'm going to tell you exactly why. Inside of the financials, first and foremost, I am absolutely unequivocally in short positions inside of the financials. I'm short the XLF. I'm actually short a little, uh, you know, Wells Fargo. Come on, who doesn't want to be short Wells Fargo? Okay, I'm short the financials, you know, and if we break to the upside in the financials, I'll continue to actually short into it. I'm not fully allocated. So remember, in the short duration, in the short duration, I think that bonds could still sell off, okay? And if bonds, bonds sell, okay, this will actually take the, the financials, break, break them a little bit higher, just a little bit higher. Anywhere in here, though, could be a, a short op, short opportunity, okay? I think you have a short opportunity pretty much anywhere in here. You just have to be willing to sustain that short opportunity for a period of time because, what do you have going on? And this is this is where immediately people are going to counter me and they're going to say, no, 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 because the financials just got approval for what? In June 30th, June 30th, the uh, the financials, in large part, okay, they're allowed to actually up their dividends, okay, and they're allowed to do buybacks, and that's all well and good, okay? But all of that is for nothing. It's for nothing, because if those bonds start to do what? If those bonds start to rally, Interest rates are going to go back down. They're absolutely going to crush the uh, the financials. There's a reason that that level right here is marked on my screen. That's 2650. Okay, and I I would put a target on the back of uh, of that particular level of the 2650. So this is something actually that has held true for uh, for quite the period of time. Now, if the financials okay do it again, this is a little bit of a longer duration trade. Like I don't want you to believe this is going to happen overnight and materialize overnight. Again, as I said. I think the uh, the bond market could still go, could still go a little bit further down, and eventually they'll put that floor in. Those things will uh, they'll rip back to the upside, because uh, again, anybody that believes that they're just going to allow when I say they, anybody who believes that the Fed is just going to allow the bonds to deteriorate and continue to see some sell side activity in the bonds, uh, listen, they're they're going to have to have supportive you know tone to that, and you'll start to hear, you know, in some of the uh, some of the Fed speak. 
uh, when they start talking about, oh, we might have to have some type of an operation twist in here, which we've talked about kind of incessantly lately. So very important to understand the dynamic. Bonds could sell off in the near term, test the Fed. The Fed actually will threaten the marketplace. The marketplace goes back up in the bonds. If the marketplace and the bonds goes back up, they'll actually take the financials down. With the financials coming down, I would anticipate that the energy sector is also going to come down. Again, the energy sector already got whacked back. Huge bounce back to the upside. Okay, maybe gets back to the 52, even 53 handle before possibly rolling back over. But the energy sector is right there with it. Once again, I want to reiterate this. Okay, I think the most difficult trade to discuss here is technology. Clearly, okay, the QQQs, the performance on a year to day basis, it's not there. I mean, the Qs are generally speaking flat on the year. Okay, speaking of the QQQs, all right, they're flat on the year. Take a look at the IWM. The IWM is still up about 14% on the year. And the, uh, the spider stuck in the middle with you uh, up about 7% kind of year to date. All right, snap back to the chart over there. So I've already gone through a couple of the trade setups. Obviously, I feel that tech, okay, is kind of the odd product out. But I'm going to give you another take on that here for just a moment. As I was saying, okay, if you looked back at this, uh, this week of trade, all right, there's, there's a couple of things that can be learned from looking at the, uh, the expected moves in IWM, the QQQ, and the spiders. And again, this is it's actually why I started this weekend's update with talking a little bit about expected moves that everybody was just kind of in the know. So if you look at the spiders, the spiders almost hit their upside of the expected move, right? Just And, and what do the spiders do throughout the course of the week? I'll zoom in here for a second, because there's some important takeaways on here. A little bit of sell side activity, okay, and an absolute rip to the upside, right? What do, for instance, the IWM look like? The IWM in just stark, stark contrast. The IWM just saw absolutely, okay, hideous people, hideous sell side activity earlier in the week, okay, and absolutely rips back, but ends up on the edge, the lower edge of the expected move. So the reason I'm actually showing a little bit of contrast in this particular case is that the sell side activity in here was just, just wicked. It completely, the IWM completely diverged from the rest of the, uh, rest of the marketplace. And last, but definitely not least on this front, take a look over at, uh, none other than, okay. The, uh, the cues and the computer, <laughs> I mean, Again, it's completely divergent marketplace. The queues earlier in the week were actually rallying. They sold off, then they rallied. Okay, here's the biggest takeaway. Everything was all over the place until Thursday and Friday. Something in this marketplace changed on Thursday or Friday. Okay, and it, I actually saw it a little bit on Wednesday, Wednesday evening, but um, something absolutely changed in the marketplace Thursday, Friday. What changed? Correlation kicked in. If you take a look at that uh, that last minute gamma squeeze, and it's one of the other reasons I mentioned kind of the last minute gamma squeeze to begin with here. If you take a look at that uh, last minute gamma squeeze, okay, it actually kicked the S&P 100 into a correlated state. Come on. I want you to look back, and I'm dead serious about this. You look back, and what other time, okay, in the last, what, weeks, months, like almost two months, have you actually seen a 90-10 advanced decline line? Okay? You have it. We just haven't did that. We've been a slop fest every single day. Yeah, 60, 40, 40, 60. Okay. It has been just a demonstrously hideous slop fest of a marketplace that all of a sudden kicked into correlation. And that's actually why, okay, I'm a little bit more nervous about the QQQs than any other product in here. Why? Because I think if the bonds start to rally, and this is where I'm actually going to throw a little bit of an opinion piece in here, but if the bonds start to to, to rally back up in the next couple of weeks. Correlation could actually kick in and sell everything. They may actually turn around and, and sell the financials and with the financials, maybe tech gets sold in there. And that's why, that is why I'm calling tech into question. I don't have a feel for it right now. Okay. You know, as a trader, you have to, you gotta, you gotta know what you know and know what you don't know. And, you know, coming, coming to that conclusion is extraordinarily helpful. I, I'm not going to make any two ways about this. I'm actually carrying some very large positions inside of tech, okay? But uh, yeesh, I'm nervous in those positions. Whereas if you look at uh, my directional positions inside of the uh, financials and the energy sector, okay, feel pretty good about them because, again, I think that the floor comes into the bonds. The bonds actually rally back up. The big question mark, though, is what is tech ultimately going to do in a reaction, okay, 
to that. So think about it because, again, with correlation kicking back in, what I'm basically saying is if the financials start to sell off, if energy starts to sell off, you know, the question is, is tech going to uh, to sell off with it? I mean, tech has already been kind of beaten and bludgeoned a little bit this year. The fact that it's what? I mean, hey, let's just, you know, call it what it is. I mean, tech's roughly speaking flat on the year. That doesn't mean, though, that it, you know, it has to catch up to the upside. The other products can actually see some sell side activity and catch up to the downside, uh, if you will. We're at a very dangerous little place in here couple last things that I want to uh, to bring to your attention. If you do look at the bond market right now, the bond market continues from an implied volatility ranking standpoint. Look at the IV rank, okay? This is a one-year chart. The IV rank, it's rocking to the upside. In fact, it's uh, worth noting, come under option statistics here, it's HV percentile, okay? IV percentile is like 38%, but uh, we are one of the higher instances, again, one of the higher instances of, uh, of implied volatility that we've seen recently inside of the TLT, okay? It's, um, it's notable because that's why I'm telling you that the bond market is, is very large, and, you know, part of what's going to go on inside of the S&Ps, what's going to go on inside of tech, what's going to go on inside of financials and energy right now because the, uh, the volatility inside of the bond market is absolutely rocking, okay? The other part of that equation that, uh, that might be worthwhile, okay, it, um, I believe that some of the bond volatility will eventually spill back over into the S&Ps, which actually brings me to kind of one of my, uh, my final thoughts here on this, uh, this weekend's update, and that's the VIX. Okay? The VIX effectively closed at its lowest point. Now, I know that we're near an all-time high inside of the marketplace, neither here nor there. Okay? The VIX closed at one of its lowest points literally since the onset of Corona, and I was mentioning that in last weekend's update too. Um, I think it's advantageous at this point. Okay. I think that uh, vol spreads, vol spreads can be purchased right now. And is it a deal? Maybe. Okay. But it's a cheap shot to the outside. If you're, if you're looking like anytime in the next 52 days for like a wild and woolly sell off inside of the S and P's. Okay. Way out of the money. Again, way out of the money. VIX spreads are trading dirt cheap because the skew inside of the VIX is huge. Like, look at this. I'm buying like a 126% implied volatility, selling like 160% volatility. The skew is wicked inside of the uh, inside of the VIX product, you know, and it's it's advantageous. It's just it is it's, it is what it is right now. The, that's advantageous. Skew is massive in option chains at the, at this point in time. With that, we are, and I want to reiterate this, we are actually coming into a four-day trading week. We're going to come into a four-day trading week. Um, the uh, the equity marketplace is effectively closed for the uh, for the Good Friday and, of course, uh, Easter holiday weekend. So in a four-day trading week, we're only looking at about a $60 uh, anticipation of movement. Hey, sit back and, uh, and watch the show because a $60 move is going to be easy to tag to the upside or the downside, okay? Hitting the all-time high inside of the S&Ps, okay? Get this through your head. There's divergence in the marketplace. The NASDAQ, okay? The NASDAQ's nowhere near. Nowhere near, you know, for instance, it's all-time high. Obviously, it could pick up steam. But uh, you will need, you will need that NASDAQ to rage to the upside for the S&Ps, okay? To really explode uh, much higher than they, they currently are. Nevertheless, in the backdrop of everything, okay? Got to keep eyes on those bonds. Don't forget them, Adam. Because uh, in large part, yeah, the bond market is still absolutely running the show. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here at Theo Trade. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.